Hi, I'm Ed Sproling. I'm the editor in chief of semiconductor engineering. I'm here with Jeff Tate, the CEO of FlexLogic, who's going to talk today about AI inference acceleration. Jeff, as we look at these chips, there's a lot of moving pieces here. It's not just you put in an accelerator uh, chip and it's going to work. There are other things that have to go on here too, right? So now, what are some of the considerations you have to take into account as you're designing and developing these chips as well as the systems? Yes, well, there's a wide range of uh, inference accelerators, Ed, and a wide range of applications of inference accelerators. So what customers need to know when they compare inference accelerators is, first, they need to understand what they need, what are their musts and what are their wants, and then they need to understand the metrics that are important to look at to consider which inference accelerator is likely to be optimal for their application. And when you think about an accelerator, the, the whole idea behind an accelerator is that you're working with a more general purpose type of processor, and this is much more tightly tied into the algorithm, right? In a typical system, there will be uh, a processor that's handling non-AI applications, and the accelerator is there to greatly increase the throughput uh, for the neural network model for the customers so they can do real-time recognition, et cetera. So let's drill down into this a bit. There are a number of different things that you have to really focus on with accelerators, one of which is the you want to deal with latency. What are some of the things you have to worry about and consider as you uh, start designing these accelerators when you're trying to knock down the latency? Well, uh, latency is an aspect that's important, but it's uh, important to compare latencies not just by themselves, but you need a certain level of accuracy. You need to know whether it's batch size equals one. So using a single metric isn't likely to lead you to the right conclusion. It'd be like comparing two different flights to New York City. You know, there's all sorts of ways to get from San Francisco to New York City, some are expensive, some are cheap, some have no leg room, some have tons of leg room, some have free drinks, some don't. You know, so it depends on what you want, which one's going to meet your needs the best. And just saying, okay, give me a certain price, you, you can get the two different seats on two different flights and get two totally different experiences. So you have to look at all the factors that matter to you. In the case of an airline seat, it's, it's leg room, it's width, it's, it's how long does it take me to get there, is the service good, all that stuff. In the case of an inference accelerator, there's a certain amount of stuff that's inside the inference accelerator. Things like max, tops, memory, interconnect. And those things are important, but what the customer actually cares about and needs is you know, what's the latency for my neural network at the batch size that I care about and how much will it cost me and how much power will it take? And you need to understand all of those issues in order to make the right decision. And this is one of the things that makes the comparisons very difficult, right? Because now you're dealing with, I've got a unique system here versus somebody else's, which may be different. My needs may be different. There's a lot of variables that you have to take into account and really customize this for whatever you're trying to do. Yes, yes. Um, but generally, you can boil it down to a small number of metrics. You know, there, there's, the, there's how things are done and there's the end result. So the customer really probably should care a lot less about how things are done and should focus more on you know, what's the batch size, what's the latency, what's the image size, uh, what's the accuracy? And accuracy captures a lot, of, a lot of issues. Because you can have a chip that sounds like it's great, it has tons of max, it has tons of memory, but it may not actually give you very good throughput or, or very good power. That accuracy is really important, right? Because you can have very, very fast, low precision computing or you can have very slow, incredibly accurate computing. You have to find that balance in what you're trying to do for whatever your end, your end uh, goal is, right? Correct. And all of that is sort of boiled into ac prediction accuracy. So you can run models. Uh, you might remember a company called Xnor.ai. They got by Apple, I think. They basically had binary models. 
So uh, most accelerators have integer eight or 16 bit floating point for models. If you do a model and you use binary networks, you're going to lose a significant amount of prediction accuracy, but it'll be faster and it'll take less hardware. So if you don't care very much about accuracy, that might be the better solution. There's also a sparsity or pruning. All accelerators recognize the fact that some number of the weights in, in, in the neural network may be zeros. And they're smart enough to realize that you don't have to do the multiply if it's a zero. You know, zero times anything is a zero. But uh, a shortcut that a lot of people take out there is to force a certain number of amount of sparsity. They're basically going to retrain the models in order to generate weights that have 75% or more zeros. Well, in the process of doing that, you're going to reduce your prediction accuracy. But if you have large blocks of zeros, you can skip a large amounts of the multiply accumulates and reach and process more frames. If you have 75% zeros versus 5% zeros, you've just made it so you can do four times less max, but at a cost of accuracy. So accuracy is something that is little talked about in comparison of these accelerators in terms of the press coverage. But when we talk with customers, it's critically important because it's pretty important in most applications that they accurately determine that there's a person, a car, et cetera. And with AI, what you're really getting to is no longer just a fixed number, it's a distribution. And that distribution is how accurate are you predicting something? So for example, is something, is this likely to be uh, what you think it is on an, on an image recognition of a car moving at 70 miles an hour? Is it a rock? Is it a piece of uh, uh, driftwood or whatever it happens to be? You need to know that to a certain point, um, you need to know if it's going to be moving and whether it's a person, right? And all that is reflected in the accuracy. Uh, correct, correct. And so uh, many of the products out there that tout high throughput at low power achieve it by essentially sacrificing accuracy. If you start with uh, say a, an NVIDIA product, you know, they do full accuracy and that's your, your reference point. If you either increase the sparsity by retraining and get more zeros, pruning it's called, or if you go to integer four or, or binary models, you're going to give up accuracy. And then the customer has to decide is whether that give up is worth any reduction in power or cost. And that reduction in power is one of the key elements here, right? Because you're trying to say, okay, this is running on a battery. It may need less precision for, for some instances and some applications than it would for others versus if it's plugged into the wall, you've got much more uh, flexibility in terms of this, this can be much more accurate. Yeah, different applications are going to be different, like I said at the start. So if you've got something where, I don't know, it's like a doorbell and you're trying to recognize something, it's a much more constrained application. You're, you're not going to expect in front of your doorbell uh, airplanes and things like that. You can train the model for a limited subset of you know, human features. You don't need 60 frames per second. You, know, you just need to tell that, okay, there is a person at the door you know, like in a few seconds even is probably fine. Uh, but if you're in an application like a car or an airplane, things happen fast and it's critically important that you are as accurate as possible. And then there's applications in between. So how much does this enter into the actual design of the accelerator chip versus all the peripherals around it? Is it all, all the above you need to, to think about all that at once or can you do this in, um, hey, I don't need as fast a response, therefore I can cut down on this or I can cut down on the, the different algorithm or I can, with uh, uh, precision, or I can uh, use a different uh, link that's a, that may be slower. Well, when, you, when you're designing the accelerator, you, you have to make a decision as to what level of accuracy you want to achieve. If you want to have a highly accurate, um, the ability to process uh, neural network models with high prediction accuracy, 
you need to be at least an 8-bit integer. If a well-trained model with high prediction accuracy has some zeros, okay, take advantage of it. But you don't go and retrain the model to increase the zeros because that lowers the accuracy of the model, the pruning feature. So uh, if you see a chip that, for example, talks about it can do hundreds of frames per second of YOLO V3, but it only has a few megabytes of memory, that tells you that they've taken substantial shortcuts because the, just the integer weights for your V3 is 62 megabytes. Uh, you, you can achieve much higher throughput by trading off accuracy. It's, there's, there's knobs. There's accuracy, throughput, image size, cost, power. And depending on which of those are important for you, you can come up with the application that's best for you. So I'm not saying that products that have binary weights are bad. I'm just saying that they aren't going to give you the accuracy that that model that customers need in other spaces of the markets uh, that are out there. Is accuracy the new metric for the equivalent of what Moore's law was for chips? Do are we constantly moving toward more accuracy, more precision as we go forward, or is it very specific to the application? Every application would like to have the most accurate. Uh, model with the highest frame rate and the biggest image sizes at no cost and no power. <laughs> that that would satisfy everybody. So since that isn't available, then customers have to start making trade-offs. And it, they'll make different trade-offs for different applications. And this is the, the big trade-off is how much power do you use? How much uh, heat do you generate? Um, how much does it cost? Um, what's the, the maintenance of this thing? The, the, there's a whole total cost of ownership type of uh, equation that goes with this, right? Yes, yes. And the customers we deal with, you know, they, they generally are all shipping products using existing accelerators from the market leader, okay, which is NVIDIA. And what they're looking for, they say, hey, this is a great product, but nobody out there that I've ever met says, uh, I have all the throughput that I, I want, that I've got the biggest image size that I can handle. They all want more throughput, bigger images, lower cost, lower power. But it has to be accurate, at least in the customer space that we're talking about. Are you finding that um, within some of these big systems that things are becoming more heterogeneous? So instead of one type of accelerator, now there will be multiple types of accelerators and even though you have a a uh, collection of Macs that may be or GPUs that are running in the center of the uh, chip that each one of those may be sort of independent or groups of them may be independent with different kinds of accelerators on them? Uh, what we see is that there's a general purpose processor and there's an inference accelerator and some products like for example NVIDIA Xavier combined those two into a single chip. Uh, the, the customer doesn't much care as long as it meets their performance and cost and power and size objectives. But, you know, not everything's going to run on an inference accelerator. And the general purpose processor is too slow to do the inference at the speeds that the customers are interested in. But will everything run on the same inferencing accelerator or will it be different ones? In most applications, there's going to be one inference accelerator. But, you know, that's most of the customers we talk to, they have one input sensor, they've got one model, and that's what they're optimizing for uh, an ultrasound machine, a gene sequencing, uh, a scientific camera. But, you know, if you go to cars, well, cars will be different. You know, cars have many cameras. And they'll have the distributed inference accelerators. Uh, but that is the, tends to be the exception. The cars are different from all the other products that we tend to talk to customers about. And this is one of the, the big changes that we're seeing at the edge, right? Is it, it's a, a whole uh, spectrum of things that are coming out here and there's opportunities for all sorts of different new ideas that we've never seen before. And almost all of them have intelligence built in at some level. 
So now you have to figure out, okay, what's the best way to move forward with this stuff because you do have all these different options. Uh, that's right. The edge inference market is expected to grow faster than any other portion of the AI space. Starting from a small base and it'll get much bigger as chips become more powerful, more powerful in terms of throughput, not power, at lower price points. Jeff Tate, as always, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks very much.